Yes, we yeah. still have some, have some, David. Um, we're also hoping to finish corn today. Um, we're located near Tappahannock and it's still very wet. So we haven't been able to get in the field. So wet, so wet out by Tappahannock. You know, I'm in uh, Montrose, uh, Northern Neck. So I know exactly what you're talking about, so wet. And uh, well, you know, you got some time still, you know, we got some fair weather ahead of us, but I know you want to finish that corn, corn before beans, probably, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. Well, well, again, welcome to the small farm or grain round table discussion. I think Mr. Sachs and uh, <laughs> got the conversation started. Uh, so, hey, I, I, I don't I like that energy. I like you bringing that to it. So let's talk about what's happening this season. Um, how's 2020 been for you, Mr. Sack? I'm sorry, I beg your pardon? How's 2020 been for you in terms of grain? <clears throat> you know, it's been a challenge. It's been a challenging year, but rewarding. Uh, we had some of our best, uh, best wheat we ever put out. Um, beautiful field that came out of rotation uh, that had been in pasture for a number of years. So beautiful wheat came out of that field. That was great. Of course, with COVID beginning of the year, we saw an explosion in demand for home baking. And it uh, seems like everybody wanted to, to talk about baking and flour. Uh, so there's tremendous interest. Uh, personally, we learned a lot this year, but there's been some failures. You know, there's been some mistakes. We're learning opportunities, learning opportunities. But um, you no, know, we're very fortunate, and everyone's been—you know—most importantly, everyone's he healthy. We had no accidents this year; uh, no one got hurt, and we're all healthy. So I think this—that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Yes, it is. And Shannon, how was your how was your year this year? Well, first of all, David, I want to say thank you for having that positive attitude. Um, I appreciate that in a very challenging year, and I think we should all focus on the positive. Um, I'm glad to hear that your wheat was successful. Unfortunately, we lost almost all of ours to a late frost, just kind of a freak thing, but it happens. And again, just the lay of the land um, where we had most of it, it was just low lying, so got hit pretty hard. Corn, of course, was a very marginal crop for us this year due to the lack of and the timing of the rainfalls. So like I said, we are trying to finish getting that out today. Um, and soybeans have been a brighter spot. Of course, with the higher commodity prices, that's also um, cause for um, positive um, thoughts on that today. So hoping to get that out in the next couple of weeks or so, there is rain in the forecast um, for tomorrow and then on Thanksgiving, but hopefully we can um, get that out in the next couple of weeks. So I'm just curious, uh, I, I'm just, just real quick, just a quick response, and I know I don't want to get off tra track, but what, what was your plant date uh, on that week that got frost killed? Do you remember? Honestly, I'd have to look that up. I'd be afraid to tell you because I'm afraid I would be wrong. Oh, well, that's, I understand. I just I didn't know if it was because it was too early or too late. Anyway. Um, I don't think think that it was just the bizarre timing of the frost. Okay. All right. All right. Hey, Shannon, you mentioned pricing. How has pricing been for the season on all commodities? Um, as I said, the soybeans are um, consistently seem to be going up. So that is the positive. Um, the others have been um, pretty steady but still kind of low in comparison to the rising cost of inputs. Understood. Yeah. Has there been much uh, coronavirus relief from the USDA for small, small for grain? Yes, there has been some. <laughs> Mr. Sack, talk about yourself. You had a good pricing year this year? I'm so glad that we're, we're joined on this call within context of our uh, Common Grain Alliance members, brothers and sisters. We got a lot to talk about when it comes to pricing. Uh, 
<laughs> Fortunately, you know, the market's been kind to us. But, um, you know, as a result of grain quality, you know, just quality alone, we felt fair to, to lower price in some of our grains. Um, and so it's been a hit. It's been a challenge. On the other hand, we, uh, you know, did really quite well on, on bushels and acre and got an awful lot of it. So uh, kind of mixed bag on pricing. Gotcha. Has uh, you got any coronavirus relief from the USDA or anyone else to help offset some of those bad prices or not as good prices? No, we have not applied for or received funding from any relief program. Very good. So for, let's say, some new or beginning farmers uh, that may be looking at getting into grain, what would you recommend on how to get started? Uh, being that we came off probably a most peculiar year in 2020. Mr. St Mr. Sachs, would you have any recommendations? I'm sorry, would you please repeat the question? For newer beginning farmers that may be looking to get into uh, some grain production, would you have any recommendations for how to get started, especially with uh, our unique season 2020 Wow, um, targeted question right off the bat. Um, advice, I'd say study your markets. You know, study your markets, figure out, make sure that you, you understand what you're growing and why you're growing it. You know, make sure you've got a, you've got a market for it because it's, an, it's, a, it's a painful experience to lose it all or convexly to sit on it. Uh, so make sure you understand your market and are able to move it. I mean, Lord, there's, there's so much. There's so much that goes into new first time uh, or new farmers. There's so much that goes into that first couple of years, and the infrastructure is so important up front. Uh, it, it it really is important that you understand your market and why you're doing it. How long did it take you to set up your infrastructure? How long have you been doing small grain production? Uh, great. Well, well, we we founded, uh, or rather, I say our first organic fields were certified in 2006. But it wasn't until 2016 that we built a facility that was going to help us process our grains. Uh, 2017 and 18 saw growth, and certainly scaling up as we met uh, our capacity. Uh, and then 19 and 20 it has really been sort of establishing market. So uh, understanding, you know, building relationships, uh, building consistency in the product, packaging, handling, quality, uh, and making sure our customers were able to trust what they were receiving. So, uh, so not terribly long, um, but um, long enough to have made some mistakes and learned from them. <laughs> Indeed. And you mentioned your organic, and that's not something you don't hear a lot about in terms of grain production. How do you keep down uh, weeds and, and you know, really weeds? Well, that, that we can do a whole separate seminar on that. And I, w I will say there's a lot of praying involved. <laughs> uh, it's timing, you know, it's timing and tillage. It's, uh, it's cover crops and, and crop rotation. It's nutrient management and understanding what's happening in the soil, or at least attempting to. Um, but crop rotation, uh, reduced tillage, um, and sort of timing, the timing of things. And, and the biggest thing this year for anybody that's out there that is trying to do organic grains, uh, a tine harrow. Uh, we have an Einbach tine harrow that has really changed the game and our ability to early season control and mitigate weeds in the field. Uh, and reduce their pressure through through March and April uh, into June uh, when it becomes a boot stage and it's too late for us to get in there. But that's been, the Tyne Harrow has been really, really great. Very good. Um, as, uh, hi, my name is Sherry. I'm, I haven't done anything with small grains. I have a small um, micro dairy organic raw. And so I was considering converting some of my fields to grain. And so I, I personally, which may be too, too specific and not for the group, would be really interesting 
it in hearing how you started out in terms of did you use herbicide initially to to kill off the existing sod or did how did you do that I guess that's to David's was, was this an open uh, question? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, you're. I, I didn't. I didn't think I would reach anybody who's doing organic um, production. Okay. So, well, sure. No problem. No, I'll answer that. And of course, you know yeah. that there's the, there's a, the, the transition period. You got three years from your last uh, herbicide application uh, before you're if you're going to pursue certification, which is a separate discussion on whether or not it's worthwhile or. It's appropriate for your 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 location, your operation. I mean, I've heard it said that you can't do grain without glyphosate, and I think that's 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 not necessarily true. Um, however, we have <clears throat> we've seen success in fields that we've 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 noticed a weed problem where there are uh, particularly onion or alums. Uh, or dock, you know, some some root rooting weeds, especially for our region on the northern neck, pigweed, uh, Johnson grass. These are typical things that you hear people say. But if there's a real problem in the field, you know, you have to weigh your options and make sense. Does 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 it make sense to do a, a chemical burn down, an application of herbicide, uh, and then a, a replant into a cover crop, then to stabilize the soil through the winter? Um, or if you're going to go straight into something else that it may not be marketed as organic, but you could look at different ways of marketing the grain as naturally grown or different certifications and, and ways that you could authenticate your practices. But what it comes down to, I think, is that, you know, every field is going to be different, you know, and your, your issues, your problems may be different than your neighbors. Um, and you got to make a decision if you, if it's right to take that field out or if it's more valuable to to deal with. Let's just say there's a you know a tenth of an acre within a five acre field that has a particular weed issue. If you take that tenth of an acre out of production, what's the cost knock on that versus taking the whole field out of certification for three years? Uh, you know, and, and and making that judgment, but certainly I think there's a case for there's a case for selective and limited use of herbicide when and where appropriate, but certainly not blanket coverage on prescription multiple times a year. That's just my take on it. Thanks. All right, Mr. Otis K, are you on? Yes, mm -hmm. I am listening. Uh, sir. How was your 2020 this year? Well, it's just like everybody else, up and down. So we uh, we had about 20, a little over 20 acres of wheat, and that did real good. Uh, I was, I was uh, satisfied with that. And we had um had uh we were late getting our beans in, so we're waiting on. On the from one of the guys that have a thirty foot planter, so I had been been renting a ten foot planter and and, and no tilling and no, but I I thought I would eat him because he had a better planter and would I should have thought I would get a better seed bed, but he was custom planting for other folk and where the big money was at, and so I had to wait for him after I turned down after I canceled the room on the little drill and so when he came in and it was first of july before he planted the first uh beans for me and uh so the deer had a field they own on nine acres of those and destroyed them the uh combine about seven acres of the day they went about 20 Push it to the acre. Still got about eleven acres to do now, and, and I, I guess if I get twenty per acre on them, it'll probably be right good, because they were for the lateness, and then they did hit them right bad too. Uh, twenty the field that I had the wheat on, that uh, I had the company come in and 
and we planted that and, and we but when they sprayed it they put some kind of put the wrong chemical on it and it ruined them but they wound up paying also I guess I came out hard on that because they estimated it, gave me an estimation of 40 bushels per acre on it. Uh, so, uh, I guess overall, it's not too bad. As, but then we do do some hay, so we've been moving with hay, cutting, baling hay. Uh, we've been moving right much of that. I do. I hear someone ask about this small farm. I do have a young grandson that uh, he interested in it. Cause, uh, first of all, I'm I'm just near about a <laughs> near about a heat sea, but near about a harvest farm. But I'd like to do it, fool with it. But he's interested in farming, and but uh, I guess the thing is to try and find some land to rent here, because most of the land around here, all the big farmers got it all, and so. That's been a, a problem for him to get into it. And I was hoping that I might could rent some more and give him a, a taste of it. But, you know, he, he always got all the update on the videos and watching them doing. And he, he tried to help me as much as he can doing this, that that I'm doing. But I guess that's my take on it is. Well, I would love to see him to get over by some land where you know, he could do it and get it start get started in it. But this Very way good. I'm at. How's your pricing been for the season? The pricing. You you said price. Yes, sir. Well, uh, the uh, the wheat did good. I think it was. I think it was four fifty something. I think it was one because that that did pretty good. Uh, the soybeans, I, the little uh, field that I come out of, they did, did we it was one hundred and forty three bushels in there, and they, the price on that was eleven eighty one yesterday. So I would would like to have would like to have. <laughs> uh, a few hundred thousand bushels at that price, <laughs> it would be <been> great <laughs> yes, compared sir. to the eight or nine dollars that it was at. Very, um, and did you get any uh, coronavirus relief from the USDA or any other agencies or organizations? Oh, uh, I haven't applied for anything yet, and I didn't know exactly. Oh. Um, we did get something from the farm service agent, I think, early part of the year, and but I haven't feel haven't applied for anything. And I guess you can update me on what is out there. If we get a chance later on. Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll definitely let you know so you can go to, go ahead and apply. Okay. Yeah. Thanks everybody for their comments and input. I'm gonna pivot a little bit to uh. Heather Goiner, Coiner of a uh, Common Grains Alliance. I'm going to share a little bit of a presentation on some other smaller grains that she, her organization does and takes in and uh, markets uh, for small grain producers. Heather? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah. great. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, uh, I really appreciate um, being invited to speak today. Um, thank you, Michael, very much. Um, I, uh, my name's Heather Coiner. I'm, hi, David. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I'm a founding chair of the Common Grain Alliance, which is a relatively new nonprofit that is working on um, building up and strengthening the regional grain economy in the mid-Atlantic. Um, and we are, we were founded in early 2018 um, by a group of 13 individuals who um, all care about, um, you know, small farms and the local grain, local economy, local food economy. But we all noticed that um, we all noticed that staple foods like grains and beans and corn um, were pretty much absent from farmers markets and from the local food economies that we were participating in. Um, and we thought that that was 
uh, something that should change because these are staple foods. They're, most people get most of their calories from those, um, you know, and they are, they really are defining features of everybody's culture. Um, so, and there's really no reason why we can't grow those. Uh, grains can fit on any kind of operation, whether you grow row crops or have livestock or dairy or whether you have a vegetable operation. Um, and there's plenty of uh, remnants of infrastructure around from, uh, from grist mills to, um, uh, to grain harvesting equipment. So we really, we really felt that it just, we just needed um, a little bit of a push in the right direction and things would fall into place. So our first project was um, to just try to find the people who are interested in, who are already growing grain um, and processing grain um, and connect them so that they can start buying from each other and know who and learning from each other. And so that was pretty much all we did the first year. Um, and, um, and it was great. We grew pretty rapidly into over, I think we're over 70 members now. Um, and we've got um, farmers, millers, bakers, maltsters, chefs, home bakers, just interested citizens. Um, and so there's a, it's really anyone who is interested in eating or growing or processing small grain is welcome. Um, and um, by grain, I'm using grain as a sort of stand in for all of the staple food crops that um, are grown and harvested like grains. So it includes beans and corn and buckwheat and millet and sorghum uh, and those types of crops as well. Um, so we, uh, after we first um, established um, a network, we're now moving towards trying to grease the wheels of that network a little bit. Um, we have some projects just starting um, that are looking at um, facilitating uh, the logistics of moving grain around uh, within the network. Um, and we are thinking about the feasibility of, uh, of regional processing hubs or shared equipment, um, things to address some of the, maybe some of the issues that you had this summer, Otis, planting your beans. Um, so, um, so that's all just getting started. Um, but the core of our effort right now is on uh, what was er identified early on as the is the primary barrier to people starting getting started growing grain in this area, and that is just know-how. Um, so we have uh, developed a curriculum um, that is just getting off the ground. Uh, we've only we've only done two webinars, but we're hoping to do a whole lot more um, once we identify really what the questions are out there. Um, but um, we have some re we have some resources now to throw at. Um, addressing some of the gaps in knowledge out there. Um, so, you know, we really are, I'm really excited to be on this call because I've already learned a ton from the discussion that has happened right now about, um, you know, about some of the questions that you, Sherry, might have as a micro dairy wanting to grow grain or, um, you know, um, David has certainly been a huge contributor in, in, uh, in you know, his, uh, his journey to growing grain as well. Um, so I, um, I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about what the questions are um, and you know how Common Grain Alliance might be able to, to help that. Um, so um, let's see. So that was, so this is our, um, this is the project that we have now. Um, and I really want to, um, I really want to emphasize that I do think that that grain can be a part of anybody's operation, um, you know, so if you have any questions, um, you know, for me right now um, about uh, about Common Grain Alliance in general, I'm happy to answer them. I certainly don't have all the answers about how to grow grain. Um, that's part of our project right now. Um, and I'm sure the answers are on, you know, in the heads of a lot of other people who are on this call because there are lots of experienced folks here. Um, but, you know, growing grain, I think, is an important part of any farm operation, um, not only because it contributes to the environmental health of your farm by improving the soil, um, stabilizing it, being a part of a crop rotation or a livestock uh, grazing rotation, um, 
you know, the grain that you are going to grow in your field is going to be, um, is going to be really nutritious. Um, and, you know, growing your own staple foods, the ones that you choose that you want to, that you want to grow puts the control of your community's food supply, you know, in the hands of small business owners, which I think is really culturally important as well. So, um, so anyway, I'd like to, you know, please, please feel free to, um, ask me questions. Um, I definitely have some questions for the group here, if I may, Michael. Um, uh, there's, I just sort of have two, two topics that I would like to get some uh, feedback on if, um, if there's time, but um, that's great. All I right now. Today. You can go ahead and ask the question. Okay. Well, does anybody have any questions for me first? I don't have any specific questions. I just want to say that I'm really excited that you're here to speak <laughs> and that um, I'm going to learn something. So thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Well, likewise, Sherry, I was so excited when you spoke up. Um, all right. Well, um, so my, you've so already sort of started to talk about um, this, um, this topic, but I'm interested if there's anyone else on the call who has tried growing a food grade grain or pseudo grain crop and if you would like to share your experience with the rest of us. How about you, Michael? Are you on this call? Michael Grants? No. Is there anyone who wants to start growing um, a grain or pseudo grain crop, but, you know, sort of has some questions or is a, are you not sure how it would fit into your operation? Um, what barriers do you face in growing that? I'm yeah, definitely no, what you, you're saying, uh, you're saying like, you know, uh, wheat particular or uh, 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 um, for meal for meal consumption or for, for well, the... any any kind of uh, any anything that you can harvest with the combine so mm -hmm. wheat rye beans corn mm -hmm. millet sorghum do you what do you want to grow what crops do you want to grow no no I, I do a little wheat every now and then and then and I think glass I raised it was, uh, it went for milling, you know, it was good enough for milling. Was that, was that what you're saying or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that millet, summer, uh, summer annual crops like millet and buckwheat um, and sorghum are incredibly important parts of crop rotations. Um, you know, they are, they, they really, uh, take they're fast growing they grow in the summertime when the days are the longest and they're really really great for improving your soil because they just pump all kinds of carbon into the soil um, and they are um, you know obviously they're culturally important grains um, so you know I think that there's a lot of um, you know we have a lot of interest in promoting the growth you know the growth of both markets markets for those types of grains um, and also um, learning more as an organization about how to promote the growth of them for growers. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Yes. Uh, most of us want to know uh, pricing. How is the pricing for your organization in the uh, Millers and breweries and bakeries you work with compared to the market price that we, they may generally get in the field? Uh, that's a great question, Michael. Um, so within our network, 
uh, most of our uh, most of our buyers are small businesses themselves, um, and they generally pay um, around thirty five dollars a bushel for food grade wheat. Um, I don't know what the pricing is for corn off the top of my head, um, but you know it's several times higher than what you would get at a um, at a um, at an elevator. Maybe David, you, you mentioned pricing earlier. Maybe you can comment on um, your pricing experience from within the network. Um, you know, I, I think you know, we're, we're as, as you said, we're generally gonna be able to command slight higher pricing through in-network uh, and, and leveraging of a value system that values local grain in a slightly different way you know, or reaching a customer that values what you've done is essential. And going to the elevator uh, just ain't it. Uh, however, on the other side of that, you know, it comes along with the entire headache of the infrastructure and supporting um, uh, processing equipment, storage, and everything else that goes along with it, uh, which inherently comes along with it cost and the expense of, of maintaining the equipment and running it and, and, and any accidents or uh, mistakes along the way. So uh, I think there does need to be, again, a, a, a nuanced and, and, and deep understanding of your market uh, with the caveat that it changes, you know, of course, from season to season um, and that new customers bring new opportunities, certainly. Uh, but, um, you know, we've, we've seen consistently that uh, throughout the past year there was there was a pre there were pressure on on commodities that were reflected into some of the larger orders where people were asking for lower prices um, so I think really it, it comes down to understanding your customer and understanding your market and being able to to position yourself so that you have a product that that um, that is in demand um, you know we, we do organic, uh, grain and organic specialty grains uh, produced for bread flour and, and for flour uh, for bakery because we, we, we see that as a, not only is there a demand there, but there's an access to a market there that could afford a higher price uh, versus doing feed grade or animal grade uh, grains, you know, where you're inherently going to expect a lower price. So uh, maybe, so, maybe the, the, this entire subject it deserves a, and I know it has done already, but deserves a, an exploration in terms of, you know, how do we develop our markets um, and access the right customers? Thanks, David. Heather, do you require everything to be organic or can it be conventional as well for the grains you all take? And that's a great question. It was, I think, one of the, one of the first topics in our meetings. Um, because most of us really value sustainable practices. Um, but we decided really early on to, um, to welcome anyone regardless of their growing practices into the organization, um, because we really feel like the most important thing is that people are talking to each other um, and that we're supporting each other um, and people are free to make their decisions about what they do with their land. Um, but we also um, committed to that uh, providing only resources um, that promote sustainable growing practices. So we're not going to we're not going to give you information about you know glyphosate applications on your fields. You can get that lots of other places. Um, you know our priority is um, you know helping people learn about how to um, rebuild their soil, how to manage pests and disease without chemicals. Um, you know and how to build that kind of um, sustainable practice. Um, but we're certainly, um, we certainly would love to have, um, you know, members who are curious about transitioning their fields or even just reducing their herbicide or, you know, pesticides um, uh, applications a little bit because every little bit helps. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Were there any more questions for Heather? Well, I got one more. Well, maybe okay. not one more. <laughs> one more. 
the type of uh, specialty grains that you grow. Can you name some of them? Uh, probably some of the non, the less traditional crops um, that maybe some of your consumers or buyers are looking to purchase. Um, are you asking whether we have uh, we have markets for those things yet? Yes, you know, some of your specialty wheats, your soft wheats, your hard wheats, uh, your sorghums, any other specialty crops or um, varieties of different um, grains that you're looking for, your customers asking for? Um, I would say the the market for um, the markets for anything but bread wheat um, really need to be built up some more. I mean, there there's certainly there are certainly people who buy them, but the quantities aren't really where they need to be just yet. Um, you know, it's really uh, if we're looking, you know, some of the work that we have to do further downstream on the value chain with buyers is really. Um, uh, working on getting you know finding finding businesses that use um use some of these uh some of the less uh popular uh grains and um introducing them to the ones that are grown regionally because they are a lot better um but also developing the markets for those is one of our one of our strategies for the next uh for the next two years um because it's uh it's very just uh, just this week, I got an email from one of my one of our members, asking if uh, saying that he had surplus uh, sorghum, millet, and buckwheat um, that he was wanting to wanting to sell, and if we had any ideas where he could buy it. So it definitely needs some work there. Very good. How about dryland rice, oats? Are you seeing any of the demand in that, or even like felt? Flour. Oh yeah, so there's tons of demand for oats. I mean, I feel like the market is wide open for oats. Um, you know, I people just this year we have oats finally in you know harvested within the network. Um, you know, and there are people. There's an oat milk producer in Northern Virginia that you know is purchasing a hundred thousand pounds or something over the course of the year. You know, my bakery uses. Uh, um, you know, several hundred pounds a year, um, but we we don't have a roller mill or a way to roll them in network. So that's, um, you know, that's sort of a logistical challenge um, that one of our millers is trying to address right now. Um, spelt is uh, also sort of relatively new to the market, but or to our to our region, but there's some beautiful spelt being grown at Grapewood by David and Fred Sachs. Um, and, um, you know, there's, uh, spelt is, has its challenge, like most oats, you have to dehull it first before you can eat it, um, and that dehuller, that dehulling equipment is a specialized piece of equipment that, um, you know, is available outside of our region up in Pennsylvania, um, so there's an additional cost to that, um, shipping your, uh, crop up there to get dehulled, so, you know, Things like you know a roller mill or a dehuller, things that the Common Grain Alliance could imagine, you know, uh, in the future, providing for, you know, for our network so that the shipping that would uh, grease the wheels a little bit for more people to be growing oats and spelt in this region um, and other things that need to be hauled, dehulled. Um, but yeah, there's a. Um, you know, there's a big need for for oats, and I think once people discover spelt and all of the beautiful things that you can do with it, um, from noodles to cookies to to bread, um, they'll be really excited about that too. Yeah, we doubled our we doubled our acreage of spelt uh, coming into this this uh, this fall, and um, you know, really have been excited by just the quality of the flour that it's produced. Uh, it is noticeably different, and there is, I think, just going back to that comment about you know building consumer education, educating the consumer towards local products beyond bread flour. That's the challenge, you know. It is because, of course, so many people, uh, when thinking about local and then flour, and that they're going to do it themselves, the first thing their mind jumps to is bread, 
And regionally, we're challenged with an ability to have the summer growing conditions and really into the sort of late spring, sort of early spring conditions that promote tillering and, and, and really get good health on the plant before the humidity sets in. In our region, it's tough to develop grain with a, a really high protein content, especially if we're doing it in, in an organic system where we can't rely upon uh, you know, concentrated ureas or the, 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 high, the high concentration nitrogen application of fer fertilizer. So if, it's, if, if we're looking to develop uh, a greater awareness around regional grains and, and specialty grains, you know, it's best for us to market them as sort of like an amend, you know, amendment to a recipe, a flavor enhancer, a flavor booster, something that's going to make your products taste uh, healthier and certainly contain a healthier, you know, it, it's a healthier product. Uh, but uh, we found that a lot of people still are going to rely upon uh, using, you know, a, a ratio of the flour that they have in their recipe is, you know, is going to be a, a something that they, they're more familiar with. And this local grain product is, is like a flavoring agent. Again, it goes back to understanding the market, but I think, you know, regionally we're looking at developing grains that have uh, greater baking potential. And uh, we've, we've partnered with Virginia Tech uh, and the Virginia Identity Preserve, uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, Virginia Tech and the Virginity Identi Identity Preserve Grain, the IPG out of their ARAC office where they are, uh, as you know, through the extension office, they're testing lots of different grains every year, thousands of different varieties through different generations and stages of, of breeding out. And uh, this year we're testing six of their best grains. Um, and we've got this grain milled and sent out to bakers uh, in the region uh, to, to test and to give us some feedback. And, and hopefully we can help VIPG continue to develop grains that are better suited for their baking characteristics and better suited for uh, for people in home use uh, and commercial, commercial use, certainly. But we want grains grown locally here uh, that may not just, you know, uh, well, because we understand there is such a demand for the bread market. You know, we, we you know, that, that, that really is something that so many people want. Uh, it's a high demand when you're, and uh, people want to be able to use the product. Uh, and the first thing their minds go to is bread. So we'll have the results of that test uh, hopefully compiled in early December and be able to provide a feedback both to the CGA group as well as Virginia Tech. And if, uh, if fingers crossed and if we're lucky, we play our cards right, then next fall, that's the grain that, you know, the winner of that test, that's the grain we're going to be planting. Uh, as it is this year, we planted a little over, I think 20 acres, 21 and a half some like acres of a, a, a 5210, uh, which is a, a variety developed by, um, developed by uh, Virginia Tech. Um, but uh, this came out of their, uh, their trials. So we're, we're excited to see where that goes this year and uh, continue to move forward as we you know, want to develop spelt and, and rye and other grains that you know, are able to diversify a little bit in what people are using. I just want to address, David, um, your comment about using, you know, local flour as a proportion in breads rather than as 100%. Um, you know, I think that that is like, especially for professional bakers, that's um, their professionals have to always balance like uh, consistency with their other values. Um, speaking personally, I'm a, I have a wood fired bakery business and a small vegetable farm. Um, and, you know, I, insist on at least 50% regional grain. But, um, you know, after that, I sometimes I have to stop there because, um, you know, because the, the very, I'm not skilled enough, you know, I don't have the skills enough to um, get a consistent result that my, you know, my customers still really, you know, expect every single time, um, you know, so that's a, that's a balancing act that I, play in my own business, um, you know, and it really speaks to one of the one of the needs that needs to go hand in hand with the development of this network is um, sharing knowledge 
among the end users on the particular like the the um, the particular characteristics of the crop that we're working with that year. It's going to change from year to year. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about dealing or about using a local product. You know, you've got a lot of very, you've got from one year to the next something new and interesting to work with. Um, but that comes with a lot of challenges, especially for people who are used to using a very uniform and industrial product like industrial flour. Um, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in knowledge sharing among bakers and among end users um, on how exactly to, um, how best to use the grain. And not every grain is appropriate for every single bread. Not every, not every bread wheat is appropriate for every single product too. And that's another sort of cult cultural shift among bakers that you, we need to get past. There is no such thing as an all purpose flour when you're dealing with, you know, regional single origin grains. Um, and, and what about okay. cookies and, and, and cookies and <laughs> crackers and muffins and everything else? I mean, cookies and crackers and, and all of those things are so much more forgiving. You can put practically any kind of flour in those and it's beautiful, um, you know, and that's the sort of, um, uh, that's the sort of thing that I would really love to see more production of because everybody eats crackers. Um, you know, so it's really, um, you know, what we need is a gigantic cracker factory cranking out local crackers made from local flour, but um, <laughs> it'll, it might be a while before we get there. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, you know, there's, I think, just realizing, um, you know, for end users that if you have a wheat that doesn't quite make grade for your, you know, hearth sourdough breads, then bake a pan loaf out of it. Or if it's not strong enough for that, then make some crackers or cookies or muffins or cakes out of it, you know. Um, so that sort of, that sort of decision, you know, decision making process and knowledge is just something we really are hoping to, um, uh, hoping to build uh, among you know, bakers and also, you know, home bakers and regular, um, uh, regular consumers who are just used to grabbing a bag of King Arthur flour off of the, off of the, um, off of the, off of the grocery store shelf. Um, so, you know, we're talking mainly about, um, about wheat here, but the same would be true for cornmeal, you know, bloody butcher cornmeal or heritage cornmeal, you know, um, behaves a lot differently than a lot of the cornmeal you can buy in a grocery store. You know, it's much more flavorful and it's much more amazing, but, and you can make everything out of it that you can make with regular cornmeal. You just need to learn, know a little bit, you know, about how uh, its peculiarities. Um, so anyway, you know, we're talking mainly about bread wheat here, but it's really true for all of the other products as well. So I have a lot of questions about how to get started. So should I should I reach out to the Common Grain Alliance? Um, yeah, that would be really great. I'd love to have a conversation with you uh, separately, Sherry. Um, I if you can see the um, the chat, I'll put my the Common Grain Alliance email in the chat. Perfect. Um, and then. But if you can't see the chat, it's just commongrainalliance at gmail.com, all one word, commongrainalliance, gmail.com. And we'd love to hear from all of you if you want to email me separately about um, any questions you have about the organization or just about what you what you need to know before you get started growing grain, because we're, you know, in the process of, of coming up with themes and topics and um, shepherding our resources to help answer those questions. So please 